How many of you would say that uh, you would consider yourself, you know, readers? You love to sit down by the poolside. Summer readers especially. You like to take a book and, and, and just gather and that that's, that's your experience. Uh, you know, you, you, like War and Peace, that's, that's going to be a novel you're going to tackle. Any, any, yeah, that's not me. I like bite-sized things. I like nuggets. I, I actually like a lot of things on the internet because they're like pithy little statements. And, and so if you're a war and peace person, you're probably only going to hit maybe one, one book this summer or something like that. But I want you to know that if you're like me, you're going to like what I'm going to share with you next. Because you get, if you read these books, you're going to just amplify the amount of books that you have all summer long. Who's excited? So at my former congregation, I, I was kind of known for having a lot of top 10 lists. Um, for those of you who are younger than me, it was a thing started by David Letterman about 40 years ago. <laughs> but today, I, I want to share with you, this is really important. This is like, this is spiritually powerful. The top 10 shortest books ever written. Who's excited? <laughs> if you read these books, you're going to crank them up. You can get through this in about two minutes. Number 10, Amelia Earhart's Guide to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Shortest book ever written. Number nine, America's Most Popular Lawyers. <laughs> Number eight, Different Ways to Spell Bob. <laughs> Not very many of those. Number seven, Everything Men Know About Women. <laughs> Not to be outdone, though. Number six, Everything Women Know About Men. <laughs> Might be a page longer. Number five, the Amish phone book. Probably not very long. Number four, the engineer's guide to fashion. I've been investing in that a lot myself. Number three, for anybody who remembers this, The Wild Years by Al Gore. Does anybody remember who Al Gore is? Number two, George Foreman's big book of baby names. For those of you who don't know, George Foreman named all of his kids George. So. And the number one shortest book ever written, The Minnesota Viking Guide to Winning a Super Bowl. <laughs> now, you may be asking yourself, why did Pastor Mark start his message out with that? Um, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but mainly, I, I want to bring up the, 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 the perspective of or the, the question of perspective. This whole psalm that we're going to be taking a look at, this is not an easy psalm. This is one of those tougher psalms. It's not, you know, kind of warm and fuzzy like, you know, Psalm 23 where, you know, it just seems like everything. It's, it's got some difficult truths in there, but it's also important that we take a look at and tackle some of the uh, important truths uh, of the Bible, the difficult ones. And, and the key verse that we're going to be looking at today is verse 12. Verse 12. And so verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a a heart of wisdom. It is very easy to live this life disconnected from eternity. Thinking that this span of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, maybe even 100 years, which might seem like a long time. I don't know about you, it's seeming a lot less long as my days continue on. When I was younger, it didn't see, it was just, you know, life was ahead of me. Now it's like, hmm, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. God wants to teach us some deep and important truths in this uh, important psalm. Difficult in some ways, perhaps, but important for us to take a look at. So if you have your bulletin, uh, it's printed for you on the bulletin. It should be also up on the screens. I want us to read this psalm together. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit longer than some of the psalms we've been looking at this summer, but let's read it together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn back 
to the dust, returning to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Wow. Some pretty intense things in that psalm. And it's a psalm of Moses. Moses, of course, the the great leader, the great deliverer of the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, led them through the desert for 40 years, saw miraculous, powerful signs from God, saw terrible things done by his people, saw the backs and forth of both God's word and law and his mercy and grace being displayed. And and really, this is a psalm that summarizes so much of who God is. And so, if you have your outline, you can take it out and you can follow along and fill in some blanks if that is something that helps you. But Moses gives us wisdom and perspective when we take a look at who God is and who we are. And the first thing that I see in this passage that Moses is trying to teach us is that God is unchanging and infinite. God is unchanging and infinite. Verse 1 again says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place through all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I believe in God the Father creator of heaven and earth, of all that we see, the amazing universe around us. We talked about it a few weeks ago in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything in creation screams that there is a creator. And and, and I get this question a lot when I teach confirmation. Well, if God created us, then who created God? Right? I mean, you know, it all kind of goes back and forth. But this verse tells us God is outside of time. He's outside of creation. God has no creator. And for our little finite minds, that begins to trip circuits and, and, and blow things in our minds. Like God is from everlasting to everlasting. No one created God. God has always been. And God is the prime mover. He is the, he is the initiator. He is the supplier of everything that we need. Interestingly enough, in this passage, Moses talks about not just the enormity and the omnipotence and the omniscience and just the power of God, who God is, but he also says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. So this omnipotent God is not only just all surrounding and all encompassing, but he's personal, he's close. He's been our dwelling place. He is involved with us. God is 
unchanging and infinite beyond what our minds can fully embrace, fully imagine, fully understand. He is the one who's behind it all. And I don't know what your perspective of who God is today. As much as we might know about God, our perspective is God is still too small. Our perspective, he's just too small. He is so far beyond anything we could fully understand. Yet he is unchanging. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. By the way, what does that really mean? (laughs) Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter, right? So maybe a better translation would be, I am the A and I am the Z. I am the beginning and the end, who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. That's who the Lord is. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. We don't have a shifting Lord. We have, a, we have a God beyond our ability to fully comprehend. But God is solid. This psalm, we're going to get into some, some difficult verses that explain some of the realities of life. But I want always us to keep centered on the fact that God is our dwelling place. He loves us. He cares for us. The songs that we just sang emphasize that. So God is infinite. He is unchanging. In comparison to us, because we are all powerful and amazing, right? (laughs) Hmm. The juxtaposition in these next verses says something different. Moses tells us that we are finite and we are frail. Verse 3 says, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch of the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning. In the, in the morning, it springs up new, but in the evening, it's dry and withered. Who's thankful they came to church today? <laughs> Thanks for these encouraging words, Pastor Mark. I just feel so uplifted. That's some tough stuff. Why would we need to know this? Why would we need to embrace this? One, because it's true. It's reality. I love that the Bible doesn't pull back on difficult truths. And we need to understand God is God and we are not. I had a professor at uh, Bible school who used to have a, a poster on his door, on his office door, and it said, two foundational truths about God. Number one, there is a God. Number two, you are not him. <laughs> we need to recognize that. I love the different places in scripture where people actually come into the presence of God. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six, he sees the Lord high and lifted up and he says, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. But the angel touches his lips with the coal and says, your sin's been atoned for. Peter, when he first meets Jesus, Jesus says, you know, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And he hauls in this boat. He doesn't say, wow, that's great, Jesus. What a great trick. Can we do that every day? No, he falls on his knees. And he says, get away from me. I am a sinful man. And Jesus reaches out his hand and says, Peter, Peter. I got you. From now on, you're going to catch men. I got plans for you, Peter. We need to understand who God is. See, there's a ditch that we can fall into. We can, we can fall into the ditch of that, that God is so other that we can't even approach him. He's so powerful. He's so amazing that we're, we fear and we cower But the other ditch is we can sort of become just buddy-buddy with God. 
You know, Jesus is just all right. Hey, yeah, he's my friend. Jesus is my co-pilot. Anybody seen that bumper sticker? Uh, there's another one that says, if Jesus is your co-pilot, switch seats. Do we have a proper understanding of who God is and who we are? Because if we do, we begin to understand the wonder of God's amazing grace. And that God, though, is so amazing, he still reaches down to us and he gives us his grace. Isaiah 42 verse 3 says, A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, God says, I got you. I will not break you. If you come to me in humility, I got everything you need. But if you come to God in arrogance, God opposes the proud, but gives mercy and grace to the humble. We are finite. We are frail. We are broken. And we need to understand the power of who God is, which leads us to the next set of verses where God is to be revered and respected. Moses, having all these experiences with the people of Israel, writes, God, we are consumed by your anger, in verse 7, terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All of our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Ouch. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If we only knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Wow, he dives into the just amazingness of the holiness of God and the brokenness of people and how we need to understand the fear of the Lord. How many of you have enjoyed the, the, the monsoons we've had the last uh, couple of days? I know different places. We, we've been getting them like crazy in Prescott Valley. It's been really cool. We've had like three really solid monsoons. I know it's not always been that, that case and everywhere else. But it's just the majesty of the, of the torrential downpour, the lightning strikes, the, 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 the wind, and just how God is at work in the midst of it. And, you know, I was watching the first one from, I opened up my garage because, you know, the wind was blowing the other way and I could see what it was doing and I could see the lightning. And I'm like, I don't think I, don't think I want to go out there. <laughs> I mean, you, you want to be right with the Lord if you're going to be out in a lightning storm, amen? <laughs> Do we know the fear of the Lord? Not the being afraid of, but the respect and the reverence that God is due. Proverbs just explores this perspective all, all the way through it. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We, we talked about this in staff this week with my, our, our staff here at the church, and, and I asked the question, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? And Brianna Hall, who's one of our children's ministry helpers and, and workers, said, Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting a tomato in a fruit salad. <laughs> I said, she's absolutely right. Knowledge is knowing things, but wisdom is knowing how to work with things and how to apply that knowledge and how to utilize that knowledge. And the more we submit ourselves to the Lord and to his word, the more we begin to understand the most important truths of what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is not good. We live in a world that has so far removed itself from God and God's word and says, I'm the one who gets to decide what is truth. 
Maybe you've heard the saying, well, is that your truth? Because my truth is different than your truth. Oh my goodness, that drives me crazy. Truth is truth. Now, I may not understand the truth. On my perspective may be different than your perspective, but truth is truth. And the more we submit to God and God's word, the more we begin to discern both the knowledge and the wisdom that he wants us to know. Reading on, uh, Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord adds life, adds length to life, but the years of the wicked, and by wicked, it just means someone who's disconnected from God. They're, people are not worse than I am. They're just disconnected. The years of the wicked are cut short. 14.27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. Proverbs 15.16 says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than a great wealth with turmoil. Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. When you are resting in the Lord, you can rest knowing that his grace is sufficient no matter what you face. Proverbs 22, 4 says, Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 23, 17 says, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. And then finally, Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts the Lord is kept safe. That's kind of the, the big question, isn't it? With all this majesty and power and, and displays of, of anger and judgment that we can find in the word, can we trust this God? Is he trustworthy? Can we come to him? We can for one reason, and that is because Jesus took our sin on the cross. That's how we know God loves us. That's how we know that God came for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What kind of God would do that? What God would, would, would become a man and do what what we do every day, and then yield willingly his life on our behalf. That's the God we serve. And that's how this psalm sums up in the last part. It says in Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord rest on us. Establish the work of our hands, yes, Establish the work of our hands. Our life is only complete when it's complete in the Lord. And he extends an invitation. He has compassion. And he is trustworthy. He extends an invitation to anyone who will receive it. He doesn't force it on us. He welcomes us and says, do you want me? Do you want my grace? Do you want my life? It's available. You don't need money. You don't need anything but a humble, willing heart, willing to receive it. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Come, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money on that which is not bread and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. 
I will make you an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Come. Your, the invitation is extended. This almighty God is a God of intimacy and power and grace and compassion. No matter how messed up our lives might be, no matter how little we may think we have, God just says, come to me and I will give you everything you need. And I will establish the work of your hands, not only for now, but for eternity. Amen. <laughs>